Welcome to Look Behind the Look, the celebrated podcast that explores your favorite looks in film, television, and fashion history. Through conversations with the fashion world's elite and award-winning hair, makeup, and costume designers on sets around the world, you will see and hear exciting tales from behind the scenes, career origin stories, and tons of advice and tips. I'm your host, Tiffany Bartok. Hello, everybody, and happy Halloween. It is our favorite time of year. It's yours, it's mine. We all know it. I'm so excited to see what everybody's gonna be for Halloween, and I don't know what I'm gonna be yet, but I'll figure it out. So who is being Esther for Halloween? Let me know, because this week's episode is about orphan first kill. I'm talking to master creator Doug Murrow, who is the man behind orphan first kill. He's the evil genius that made Esther appear nine years old so she could continue to wreak havoc on families far and wide. And if you don't know the Esther series, Orphan and Orphan First Kill are films that have a character, Esther, who is played by Isabel Furman, who is also joining us. And the challenge with Orphan First Kill is to make this beautiful young lady, who is a gorgeous woman, into a character who is convincingly nine years old and raining terror on all who she comes in contact with. We had a great time talking about how Doug Morrow made all of this happen. And Isabel has tons of stories from set about all of her shenanigans. It's an amazing episode that you're really going to enjoy if you are a fan of Esther or if you're not even introduced to her yet and you want to check it out on Paramount Plus. Go watch Orphan First Kill on Paramount Plus right now and then head back here and listen to the episode or listen to the episode and watch it. It really doesn't matter which order you go into because it's going to be fun either way. Enjoy! So let's listen and talk about their extraordinary work right now. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me, you guys. We are coming in from all over the place. I think, Isabel, you're in Sweden? Is that- Switzerland. Switzerland? Okay. I knew it started with an S. <laughs> so this is a very glamorous uh, podcast here today. Doug, you're in Winnipeg, right? Okay. Yes. All right. And are you working on anything right now, Doug? Is that why you're... Or no, do you, I'm... Do you live there? I'm on uh, holidays right now. I've uh, I've been working like mad for almost two years straight, like even through Christmas. Um, and I managed to get the summer off. So I think I'll be going back to work uh, in November. Okay. Okay, yeah. good. So but, this is vacation for you. Oh, awesome. yeah. Great. Yeah. And Very... luckily, luckily, I had it because I got COVID and then I got the flu. So uh, oh, yeah, yeah. it's amazing I'm here. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and Isabel, are you working on something or are you on holiday or are you... you... I... I've worked literally this, this entire, basically since last year, like back to back. And then this has been my, uh, well, I was supposed to have like a three month vacation that I was purposefully taking off. And then I booked a movie that I really wanted to do. So I left for two months and then now I'm back in Switzerland. I leave though in a week to start my next movie. And then that movie carries me until uh, November of next year. Oh, oh wow. my God. Amazing. <laughs> I. I am so excited to see all of the things. I mean, obviously you're an extremely, you you aren't just a nine-year-old girl. You are an incredibly accomplished actress. Um, the novice is in, incredible. Obviously that's the first one that I think of, but you've, you've, you, you're working all the time. How do you, <laughs> why do you still how look nine? I mean, how does this, let's talk about how you be nine. <laughs> I think that like, you know, I think when you're in your 20s, I think you're kind of lucky in the sense that you can look younger. I think we did a lot of teamwork on Orphan specifically to make me look nine. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, when I think about when I think about it now, looking back, it was like every single thing played a part in it. So it wasn't just like what my performance was. It wasn't just how we lit or shot the scenes. It wasn't just what Doug did every single day. It wasn't just what our costume designer did or the two doubles that we had that were on set every day. It was, it was really kind of like a team effort where we all were kind of like, well, I guess we'll see when the movie's done, how this all comes together because even though you could look at the monitor and go, yeah, it makes sense. Logically, you're still, I'm still like, right. well, I'm, I'm not nine anymore. Yeah. So yeah. I wonder how this is going to work. And, and I remember when I saw the movie for the first time, I was just, I was thoroughly disturbed mainly by the fact that I was like, wow, I really do look like I'm nine. <laughs> oh my 
my gosh. Doug, what were your challenges in, in making Isabel Pine? Uh, I, I mean, it wasn't, I mean, Isabel's correct. I mean, she's, she was in her early twenties at the time. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't like she was 40 and we were trying to do right, this, right? Right, right. Of Isabel course. Had yes. Great yeah. skin and, um, uh, you know, when we, we had done all kinds of tests, like I've been involved with this for months and months. So we did all kinds of tests with prosthetics and, and stuff. And then we tested Isabel in the, in prosthetics and dentures and whatnot. And, um, we even boiled it down to remember Isabel, we had these little prosthetics that we used for a few days and then, oh, okay. and then, uh, it came down to, you know what, there it's just so subtle that I don't think we need it. So we jettisoned those and it was just, you know, kind of a regular beauty makeup highlight and shadow. And one, one really great thing we did though was, and this was Brent's idea was to have these contact lenses made that mm -hmm. made his eyes look bigger, which, which really helped. Um, they were really, I, they were really convincing too. I feel like you would want to wear them all the time. <laughs> It's actually really funny. I could, did keep them. I kept a, yeah. one of theirs. And, and I, I will tell you this, Doug, I, there were a couple of movies that I auditioned for, one of which I actually booked the job, the one I'm leaving to do next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, the movie spans 15 years. So the first scene in my audition and the first scene in the movie like that you see me in, I'm 15. And then the last scene, I'm 35. And I totally wore those contact lenses for the audition. And they were like, you look so young. And I was like, well... <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah. this is the new anti-age i mean like this is going to put the industry on its head it's like <laughs> context about the things that that really like were um were pivotal were, were the contact lenses totally and was um the gap we painted in my teeth mm -hmm. okay Those things when when I watched the movie, those things are the things that make the biggest difference to me. And it, and it just shows you like, it, it really is those like little tiny details because, you know, if you look at pictures of people when they're kids and adults, like sometimes people look vastly different and I think I look pretty similar. So mm -hmm. it was really yeah. just like highlighting the things that are more childish. Like at the time I did the first orphan, my, these teeth had just grown in. So there was like a space between them. And it's like, how do we reverse the braces? We paint a gap in between them. The eyes mm -hmm. or something were like easy to do that were really really convincing and I think other than that we did do a few days with those prosthetics but I we think did. we realized pretty quickly that it, it wasn't vastly changing anything correct so it yeah. worth, worth it in the long run yeah. right and when when did you shoot this was it it, it was it 20 it, before COVID or after COVID after it was 2020 2020 during. yeah during it was it was it was like deep COVID, I would say. Oh my God. And we had a big outbreak here. And the, there was one day where um, I think most things in, in the city were shut down mm -hmm. and, and we were all thinking we we're going to get shut down, but because we were already so far into it, they let, us, they let us finish. And, you know, the film industry is really stringent on everything, especially back then. So, uh, yeah. We didn't have anybody who got it uh, or anything. So, oh my gosh, amazing! On amazing. Yeah. So, so you shot it in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think it was easier at the time. Like I've worked on projects since, and it's like even though you test like super often and all that sorts of stuff, it was at the time where everyone was kind of bubbled up. So mm -hmm. even like it, there was no everything was closed too in Winnipeg, which I think was almost like a blessing because we would go to set and it's like you can't go anywhere after work <laughs> you know <Yeah. laughs> so it really was like everybody I saw on set I just remember being like so happy to be around other people every day I was like such an yeah. idiot you, you, you even weren't allowed to have people in your homes or anything so right you had to um just go home and be by yourself and yeah Isabel's right it was really great to actually be with with people I remember, uh, I remember that time. Everybody was like, all the producers were like, are they really going to their hotel room? We can only hope, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't see anybody out on the, at the bar. Right. Okay. Um, so you guys obviously did not have any fun on set. I see Isabel's posts where you look bored out of your mind. It looks like it was torture. No, was tell, me about, <laughs> tell me about the funnest times that you had. Obviously the whole ending 
with the fire, the blood. I mean, this looks like it was a total party bloodbath. Can you tell me any funny days or the best day ever on set during that time? Well, can I just quickly start? Of course. Yeah, just start. Start. <laughs> the thing that made it fun was because it's no fun to be covered in blood right. every day. It's, <laughs> it's sticky and it's gross. And also, um, Isabel and Julia had big scleral contact lenses in their eyes to make it look like they had broken blood vessels. So they had all this, they were bloody and everything. Not once did either of them complain or anything. They, one, are true professionals. And two, I think you guys just made it fun for us by being fun. You did, you never complained or anything. And that's what made it great because when you're in my position and you have to go into work every morning, knowing that the actor's dreading something that right. you're going to do can be, uh, can be quite stressful on it. It was never like that at all. Oh, that's wonderful. That's like an added pressure where you feel like, you know, the, oh my gosh, I don't want to keep them in this too long. And I don't, so that exactly. was just lifted. That's yeah. so amazing. Was- See, Isabel, you're a give- giver of gifts. <laughs> oh yeah, and I mean, the part was that every day I would bring my speaker into hair and makeup, and we would play '80s music, and Doug and I would dance, and then we were like, "Oh, we actually have to like work and yeah. and get ready." And then I think you know, at first, like I think it started where we were like lowering the music as people walked in because you know, obviously, we were like deep in the middle of COVID. It's like you know, we were trying to be sensitive to everybody's okay. like so. We've been so isolated for so long, but I think after a while, I think we just realized that like, oh, this is just every day we get to go and hang out with wonderful people. And we're lucky that we get to be around other people right now. And right. we're making, which we, you know, I think for a while I was like, I don't even know if this is, you know, what what's going to happen with the world. Am I going right. to be never again? So I was just like, I'm just going to enjoy every single moment of this. And I think the shoot for me, even though, at times was really isolating because like I said, we couldn't see each other outside of work, which is normally such a pivotal, wonderful part about mm-hmm. working on being around your crew and getting to know everybody because it is such a team effort. Um, but I really felt like we bonded so much during the day that it was, it was really nice. Like I woke up every morning so excited to come to set because, you know, like a golden retriever, I was like, I get to play. All yeah. Day. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. And then, so now, so now Halloween is coming up and everybody's going to be you. Um, (laughs) I know that for the first one, there were tons of um, (laughs) copycats, uh, homages, you know, Um, what, what are the key elements to being Esther? Oh gosh. I mean, See, if I were to like see the movie and do do an Esther costume, I, every year I like post on my Instagram, like the best, like I call oh, it. Oh, you do? Year. Okay. The awesome. best actors, you know? I did a bester competition last year, which was really fun. Because it, <laughs> there was like a sexy Esther, which was shocking to me. Somebody <laughs> did it. Like there was like an open dress with like boobs. It was fabulous, yeah, but not my, totally not like what I expected. Yeah. Uh, but I would do like, try and look as young as possible with the pigtails and the dress and everything and just do gnarly teeth because that was something I loved about the first movie and even in like this movie we and Doug Doug knows we tried so many ways to like put those teeth in there because Brent was like they just look so messy or whatever and I remember in that fight scene with Julia at the end it wasn't scripted I was like I want the teeth to fall out (laughs) because it's funny it's funny that like we forget for a moment at times like who these characters really are. And sure. was, in my mind, I felt like it would be nice to have a moment to like slap the audience and be like, remember, <laughs> you know, <laughs> she's not actually who she thinks she is. Right, 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 right. Do you have any tips, Doug, for blood, blood, uh, application? application? <laughs> well, blood, first of all, to make blood is so simple. You just go to your grocery store, you get a little bottle of uh, corn syrup. Mm-hmm. Um, and get uh, a bottle of red food color, put that in the corn syrup, and you've got fake blood, which is safe and uh, probably would wash out of most things. And uh, you could even put it in your mouth if you wanted to. What'd you and- say, Isabel? Shaving cream. For removing. Oh, and they, for removing. Yeah. <laughs> that is a good tip. I wish I had yeah, known shaving, that when I was has, little. Uh, it has lanolin in it, which um, oh. really attacks the dye and lifts it. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh, you guys, this is a huge tip. This would have changed my whole childhood. Uh, but Julia, um, Julia and Isabel, at the end of every day would be like snowman just covered in, in, uh, and I think we have pictures of that. I know you have a picture on your Instagram, I think, or I do. I think I could find probably two very easily just covered in, uh, and then hot cloth and all the blood comes off. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. It's the best tip really, really truly is it yeah. worked every single time. <laughs> I love that. Are there, are there going to be more, are there going to be more Esther's? So here's the thing. I actually, like a lot of people are asking me this. I don't honestly know. Mm -hmm. I know that it's a conversation that's being had. I think that, you know, logistics wise, I don't think they're as nervous about it as they were last time. I think it just depends on if right. the fan base really feels like they want me to come back. I mean, there was a, um, <laughs> some meme on the internet that made me laugh so much and like David Leslie Johnson the producer and I sent it back and forth to each other and Brent as well and it's like they photoshopped my face in one of the pictures where I, so I looked like much older and it was like <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> in 20 years from now you go and see Orphan 3 <laughs> build it again <laughs> it's like I'm so old and I thought that was really funny um I saw that picture <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it really just depends. I mean, I, I do think it is possible. I also think that they would have to probably figure it out rather quick if that's something that they actually really want to do, because, you know, there's only so long you can continue to. I mean, like. <laughs> Well, because it was really just old school um, l camera angles, Apple boxes that that played this trick on us. Right. It was it was really like bare bones. Do you want to talk a little bit about the um, any of the controversies with CGI and the de-aging and the makeup, like how that was avoided and how you guys really stayed authentic? I mean, I'm not saying the CGI is not authentic, but no, no. I'm <laughs> I think from the outset, I don't think they, they wanted to limit the CGI as much as they could, mm -hmm. at least in terms of, of Isabel's look um, and only use it in places where they really had to. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, I mean, to me, it just wasn't required because Isabel had great skin and, um, and, it just worked with, with everything. Um, so, I mean, if they did it in 20 years, that's what they would do. Right, 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 right. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I think that it was a real effort was made not to do it in terms of her look mm -hmm. um, and to try and use every other technique possible to give the effect that she's, that she's nine. And uh and did the and camera work. angles that were selected, did they influence how you did her makeup at all? No, it would, no, it was, it was a lot of lighting and, mm -hmm. and all that. Um, and, you know, it's a horror movie. So, yeah. uh, you know, going in, you know, that a lot of it's going to be lit atmospherically right. and, and all that. So, um, and again, like I'm not um, pumping smoke up Isabel's skirt, but she has great skin. Um, and even, I think you were a little bit heavier even then, which made your face a little rounder I compared was. to now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, um, COVID, and that, COVID that, that, of course. Right. I was like, this yeah. is going to work. You know, we're just well, going to keep it. Oh, no, it totally <laughs> worked. Yeah. I, initially, when I was contacted, my main thing was, you know, when you get into your, especially ladies, when you get into your early mid twenties, like you usually really like slender out and you get, you know, cheekbones and Oh, we remember. Yeah. And that, <laughs> that was my first. So that was why in the first test I did on someone else, just to see if the, the concept would work is I took somebody in and made them rounder. Got um, it. And then did when, notice that. when we did the, the test on Isabel, again, I, I hadn't, met Isabel I'd only had her life cast mm -hmm. which is a fair representation of how she looks but even that the material can pull you down and make you look more slender than you really are so oh. I built these pieces that that would make her look a little bit rounder um can you then, explain to everyone what a life cast is sure so um a life cast is a plaster copy of of um, this is Matthew Broderick. 
uh, a plaster copy of... I just happened to have Matthew Broderick to the right. <laughs> yeah. Um, a plaster representation of the actor. So you smother their, their face and you leave their nostrils open so they can breathe with this silicone goo. And then you mm -hmm. cover that with plaster bandage as a support. And you take that off and you have an imprint of their face, which you fill with plaster in order to get this and then you use this as the basis to sculpt and create your your prosthetic appliances so then they fit the contours of that person's face exactly and how long does that take how long does isabel have to be suffocated oh <clears throat> isabel would tell you uh but probably 15 20 minutes i oh, think you have, have legacy effects it took longer to put the bald cap on just really a lot and I have a wonderful photo. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a picture of the cast because obviously my face was covered, but I just, yeah. when was it? And I was like, oh, well, this is a great picture. That looks good. Yes. That's that longer than the actual cast itself. I'm sure. Yeah. So I'm they sure. did that. Me, my, my friend Alan Scott at Legacy Effects, they did that and then they, and they cast their teeth. They shipped that all to me. Then I built everything. Um, and we were going to shoot a test. Um, but of course, because of COVID, I couldn't go to LA to do it. So I got another friend of mine, Mike Ornelas, to apply the pieces and everything to Isabel. And uh, and then they shot like tests. Like they built a set and shot different angles and did all that, didn't they, Isabel? Yeah, we did a test day in LA specifically for that purpose to see <laughs> how essentially like the movie kind of came about because I had, I had met with David Leslie Johnson for a coffee before COVID and sat down with him and was like, have you guys ever thought about making a prequel? Cause I had just been getting so many messages online, especially after this like huge Dr. Phil article came out or story came out about this family oh. that yeah, the family adopted a kid. And then it was like, found out that she was possibly an adult. And then they bought her, they said that she threatened to kill them. So they bought her an apartment and left the country. And it was a whole thing. Like, and I remember everyone I knew or didn't even know, like had met, it was sending me emails, messages being like, have you seen it's like orphans, like orphan. So I sat down with him for coffee and it was like, have you guys ever had a prequel? He's like, actually we wrote a script, we took it out, but nobody was really interested. And I was like, this is the time to take it out. Like everybody's yeah. talking about it right now. And sure enough, within like a month, Brent had signed on, Entertainment One had signed on and we were kind of like starting to move. And then COVID happened, everything shuts down. And I was like, well, you know, that's sort of it. And, and prior to COVID, they, you know, I was kind of being talked with, like talking with them about being a producer, but also more so like being a consultant because there's no way that I could possibly play the role anymore but I, I see wanted to like I was very very passionate about the fact that like you know this character was something that I created and I didn't want anybody yeah. else to put in but they went and cat tried to cast somebody and I didn't think they would be able to find anybody not to like toot my own horn but like it's really difficult to like yeah build something that's already there mm -hmm. so they called and were like we want to try and do this we've been talking with Doug and they t told me so many wonderful things about Doug and so I went for this test shoot day and I remember like, it was my first day on set since like COVID started. Everything was so like socially distanced. I built this like little set. I was like standing on my knees the entire day. <laughs> <laughs> and I had like my hair and pigtails and they put these little like prosthetic pieces. I remember thinking like, I don't know if this is like gonna work. Wow. But the teaser cut together, like you totally bought it. it I mean, it wasn't, I would right. say it as the movie in terms of how right, everything, right. Was, everything wasn't put together, but totally, totally worked. It, and proved, it, worked. it proved the concept that like I could come back yeah. and work as the role. And then, and that then when we came to Canada and Winnipeg, we had a pretty decent amount of time of testing where right. we tried yeah. the prosthetics, where we tried, they cut my hair, you know, we really kind of tried to play with it of like, you know, taking us back to, what we saw of Esther in the first movie and seeing how well we could, we could mimic it and make it work for this one. But it, it was like trial and error. I mean, the whole thing, when I, when I, we had like a wheelchair that they had built me, but like, it didn't look like I was walking. It just looked like I was like, walking. <laughs> it kind of moved her as she like I rolled in it. Move my knees. So it looked like I was walking. Like, it didn't look like a rhythm. And then right. Right. 
all of that stuff is where because I built like these flesh ma a flesh mask for a I little have person. The flesh mask, wait, that's so oh my funny. god, oh, really? I love it. I love this. I got a picture of you holding it. It's probably one of my <laughs> favorite pictures because it was our first and, um, day on set. I remember. Yeah, and we, we tried and it didn't work. all these things, but there. This is a movie where if we wanted to do all that, we would have needed like two months of prep, like with the actors and all that too, yes. right? Like to figure all those things out. Yeah, oh <laughs> that's <God>. me. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> These are great. This and, was um, wearing it and we didn't end up using uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, oh my god but, where are all but, these things now are they in your files doug the <laughs> i have a, a storage building so this is my workshop that's and i have a storage building right beside me that's right. filled with all this and so there's an mm -hmm. isabel section up in the right hand corner top Aww. and it's just her face is uh, like her <laughs> mask. we did a scan of her face that mask is there a couple of the other masks that i made and all that so her oh. teeth are there um, the teeth must be tough. If I ever go missing, I'll be like Doug Morrow as my dental. Yeah, Doug. yeah, yeah. The teeth are are. Pro what's the hardest thing to deal with? The context, the teeth, the blood, the bald cap. All of that stuff you sort of get used to. I think yeah. the teeth that's difficult is that you do talk differently with the men. Okay. So, you know, there. I think we just strategically chose times where there wasn't much dialogue, and then the when we were, when I saw the movie in LA for the first time, I remember I felt like the, like one of the last lines when I was wearing them, I didn't like the way that the dialect sounded with them. So oh. I remember that in ADR. But other than that, I mean, it's, it's, you kind of get used to the context. I got used to very, very quickly. Um, I mean, it was like a relief every day at lunch. I dug knows when I would take them off. I was like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sure. The thing was Isabel had worn contacts before as well. Sure. That's thank so God. Need yeah. a contact lens technician. And the contacts she wore were a little bit bigger than regular ones because mm -hmm. they needed to make her her iris cover the whole bigger. Um, but she was an expert at putting them in and taking them out. And yeah, that made it. And that was another thing that just made everything easy. Um was was things like that as well. So yeah. And yeah. It, also, if just going back for a second, yeah. if they made this movie with someone else, they could have made this movie with someone else, but it wouldn't be Orphan. It would just right. be, another, it'd be another tale, like the thing that happened in real life. And the thing that makes this movie Orphan is Isabel. Wow. Wow. I mean, I completely... Well, no, it's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I but but that was, I think it was just because the, we, the first time around, I, when I was, I, I remember like when I, because it was the first movie I ever did. And I remember like, how many people were involved in every single decision from like my hair color, the cut of my hair, the way that the bows were positioned, the way that my hair would look, how the scars looked, how the ribbons looked, how everything looked. And so when you have that much like infrastructure around it, it really helps you create <clears throat> character and it makes something so iconic that like, I remember even when prior, when they were looking at, people to cast there was like a conversation of like how much would it cost for them to use your face uh, and I was like what do you mean use right. my face this is how crazy that what are these like, words yeah face? they're like well we would have to scan your face and we would put it on someone else and I was like that's a no <laughs> it's like a yeah. hard no. like, yeah. if, you know, truly like they could find somebody else they tried somebody else but like if you know my face is kind of attached to my head so I was like <laughs> keep it for myself please it's so emotional too. My God. I mean, it's your face and you're, you grew up with this girl, you know, you physically grew up with her. That's it's really whoop. It's that's something to trip out about. Interesting. I was talking with um, Dave Kogeshall, the writer about it and, and Dave Leslie Johnson, and they made a really good point, which is that someone said to them that Esther looks more in this movie, like how she was supposed to look in the first movie, which I think makes a lot of logical sense. Okay. Because there are moments where I look An like adult. super like a kid. And then there are moments where right. you're kind of like, he doesn't really look like a kid. And there, there's a part of that that I think is so um, terrifying in this movie without being really like upfront in your face. Because yeah. 
you suspend the disbelief and you feel like she is a kid because of the size, because of where I am, because of how we shot it and all of that stuff. But you're also aware of the secret. You're aware she's a grown up, And so you kind of are able to kind of be in this weird place of like, this must yes. suck. You know? Yeah. And, no, and- that's really true now that I think about it because you were young, playing old, playing young, and now you're the age, well, not even the age, but almost. Just stay old. Yeah, <laughs> you know, play. <laughs> I see, I see. Yes, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. <gasps> I think for me, uh, I don't know about Isabel, the thing, the scariest thing for working on this project was knowing that there's such a huge fan base for this movie to mm. not screw it up. Like I thought about, I, I thought about that a lot. I never, Intimidating. I never verbalized it, but that, that to me was more of the, the, the stress. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot to live up to. Well, mm-hmm. I think it was a complete success, right? Everybody was uh, very impressed, wants to see more and <laughs> hopefully we will. Um and Isabel, I know you are off to the next thing. And so are you, Doug. So I'm so grateful that you took this time, this slice of your precious time with me, you two. And um, I can't wait to get everybody this episode. Thank oh, you. Guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it was great. Look Behind the Look is a Vinyl Foot production written by me, your host, Tiffany Bartok. Produced by Jace Bartok, edited by Nicole Tucker. If you're interested in learning more, find our video version on the YouTube channel, Look Behind the Look Podcast. There you can see rare photos and clips from our guests. And please follow us on Twitter at Look Behind Pod and Instagram at Look Behind the Look. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe. And tell your friends and spread the word. You can subscribe to us on iTunes or any podcatcher of your choice. Thanks for listening to Look Behind the Look.